Hey everybody, it's Sam with Paranormal Review, where we take a paranormal TV show and we sit down and actually review it, kind of with a skeptic's point of view. And um, from hearing from different ones of you that have been listening to our previous episodes, you like for us to kind of break down where the TV show is actually going and kind of do a little bit of background in the beginning and then intersperse it throughout our review. Um, many of you didn't like um, us actually reviewing the show and then at the end kind of making you guys wait to pick out you know what what was said through our research and everything so what we're doing for this particular episode is we are reviewing the ghost adventures uh, i think that's pretty much everyone's uh favorite guys whether uh you love to love them or you love to hate them it seems like everybody is always interested in them and of course they're having you know, a lot of high rating shows right now. So everybody's watching them. Like I said, whether to pick them apart or to pick up ideas of what to do in their investigations, everybody loves Ghost Adventures. But I don't want to do just a Ghost Adventures um, show. So that's the reason why we rotate different, different shows on different episodes. But on this episode, we're going to go back to the fall of last year. This episode aired on October 19th of 2019, and it was part of their four-part Serial Killers miniseries. This is the third one in it, and it's called The Ox Killer Jail, and it is about serial killer Jake Bird. And they are actually in Council Bluffs, Iowa. Uh, what is known as the Squirrel Cage Jail. That That's its nickname. And so I wanted to kind of give you guys some research. Not only the, squirts, the Squirrel Cage Jail, but also a little bit on Jake Bird himself. When... They were reportedly filming this episode, which I, I'm doing this from recall. Um, I believe they filmed this episode in late July, early August of 2019. Um, it got out that they were there. A lot of... Council Bluff and Omaha, Nebraska, which is where they were staying, were a lot of members of those towns and in that area were saying that they had seen them. And of course, they were eating in uh, a lot of local restaurants, so it was actually reported that they were there. On a lot of groups that, that I'm a member of and some inter -site, internet sites that I look on, I remember back then people saying, oh, I hope they're going to the squirrel cage jail. I had never heard of it, but I guess with um, people in Iowa and Nebraska, in, and I guess basically the Midwest area, it is a place that they've been trying to get different paranormal groups to actually investigate on TV for years. They've asked um, different groups to publicize it and everything because in that area, they believe it to be haunted. Now, this jail was built in 1885, and it was an active jail until 1869. It was placed on the National Register of Historical Places in 1972, only three years after um, 
it wasn't used as a gel anymore. The historical places of uh, Iowa and Council Bluffs, they actually bought it and they turned it into a museum. They wanted to save it due to its architecture, but also its history. You can actually go uh, during the day. Please check their website for times because it's open different times on different days. But it's uh, $7.00 for adults to go in and take a tour and for seniors and over and AAA members it's six dollars and for five-year-olds and up to adults it is five dollars five and under are free but um it is been studied people have wanted to see it like i said also for its architecture. It's called the squirrel cage or lazy Susan type of jail. It was one of only 18 revolving jails built in the United States. And like Ghost Adventure shows in the very beginning, it is a kind of cylinder where they could put prisoners and turn the cylinder and only allow one cell basically to be open at a time and you could only get to that one particular area. It was built at a cost of $30,000, and it has three floors of um, revolving, it, it's described on their website as a pie-shaped cell inside of a cage. Now, in the front part of the building, they have offices, and during the Ghost Adventures show, we actually see Jay in one of those. Um, but it had officer, offices for a jailer, for a kitchen, for trustee sales, which were actually uh, inmates that a jailer may trust for certain reasons for good behavior or they weren't in for violent crimes or something like that. And then there were quarters for women. And this type of jail, which did not really catch on, was to provide, quote, maximum security with minimum jailer attention, unquote. And what they saw was that one or two jailers would actually be on duty along with a trustee. And they felt like you could keep even violent criminals in this particular jail due to the security because of the revolving type cylinder that the prisoners were in. Um, today, though, only three revolving jails remain and all are being preserved um, as historical places and are used as museums. Now, this particular jail, when you get on their website, when you actually type in Council Bluffs Jail or you type in Squirrel Cage Jail, you can go to their website. They do have uh, paranormal tours. And the tours kind of depend on what night you choose. If you choose Sunday through Thursday, you can get a four-hour paranormal investigation from 8 p.m. to midnight for $140 for four people and then $35 for each additional person. 
Or you can choose an eight-hour paranormal investigation from 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. for $210 for six people or $35 for each additional person. Or you can get a 12-hour paranormal investigation from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. for $280 for six people and $35 for each additional person. However, since most people want to do their paranormal investigations on Friday and Saturday, obviously it goes up. Um, if you want to go on a Friday or Saturday for four hours, instead of it being $140, they charge $200 for four people. And then it's $50 for each additional person. Um, if you want to go on Friday or Saturday for eight hours, it goes up from $210 to $250 for six people. And... If you want to go for 12 hours, it goes up to 325 and it's $50 for each additional person. What, though, I thought was different was they specifically say you are not allowed to conduct any seances, you are not allowed to have any any Ouija boards you're not allowed to carry them in and you're not allowed to have a Ouija board session there is no conducting any rituals no trying to contact any demonic energies and there is absolutely no cleansings allowed on the property, either inside or out. And these are spelled out on the website. You can type it in right now and see it. And it says that you will be dismissed from the property immediately because someone from the Historical Society has to be there with you at all times. Now, it doesn't say whether or not they'll actually follow you around or they'll, they'll watch on camera or I, I'm not sure how they do that. But it specifically spells out that not only can you not summon demons, you can't do any witch rituals, you can't have seances, you can't do any Ouija board sessions. It also spells out you can do no cleansings. So, that kind of got me thinking, and I started searching around and stuff, and on their site, they do talk about how mu the museum staff has seen some things, and they also um, talk about some stories of the paranormal investigators that have been there. They also have video of interviews, and they also have audio of different paranormal investigators having been there, what they've experienced, or what they've saw. Um, it does talk about how the building was actually built on the site of St. Paul's Episcopal Church morgue and that that may have something to do with it it also talks about jm carter who oversaw the building's construction he was actually the first resident of the top floor apartment where we see zach in this episode and is said to never have left and from other websites that I looked up, uh, this J.M. Carter is fairly well known in Council Bluffs and is thought to be who people ha come in contact in the first floor. Um, however, there was a jailer 
that lived in the top floor apartment that they believe is the full body apparition that is seen up there. And um, there is some different audio where people are trying to contact him. And since this was actually on their website, this was very easy material to obtain, I wish Ghost Hunters would have went here and just investigated this as a jail investigated all of the different stories that are here and not I mean I understand that this four part miniseries on serial killers um, like I said in the last episode where we focused on John Wayne Gacy I understand that this was supposed to be a big rating straw in October, and it was leading up to their Halloween special that was at the Conjuring House, the Harrisville Farm. I I understand that, but I wish they would have chosen better places, I guess, to try to contact those serial killers which is what I said in John Wayne Gacy. And you're going to hear me say it again in this one. Because um, the museum staff say on the website and when they're interviewed in different articles, uh, I even found an article where it talks about how Ghost Adventures actually investigated the jail recently and they had just left they talked to some of the museum staff and they've never felt frightened they've never felt like they've been in danger um they've seen strange lights in jail cells they've heard occasional door openings and as one lady states she has heard some peculiar um noises a lot of people in the articles and on their website do talk about how on the third and fourth floors they do hear voices of a little girl investigators have said that they feel intense female feelings and they feel like there is a female around um also it is stated that they feel like um they have a female touch um a light type touch and two ghost cats have been seen throughout the buildings and you know i'm reading this i'm looking at articles and i'm kind of getting the feel and i'm like oh my gosh they're seeing full body oper uh, apparitions they're seeing ghost cats they're hearing voices this is such a cool place why didn't ghost adventures just go into this cold not look for jake bird not not do anything like that just do one of your old style investigations where there's four of you going to get locked in and you're going to explore it i wanted i wanted to see that however you know i was digging around and and i wanted to find out well you know are they going to find out a lot is is this some place that maybe a lot of things happened well no um on their site they talk about how they only have four deaths that were confirmed uh one prisoner had a heart attack uh one prisoner hung himself in the a sale which ghost adventures goes over also in the very beginning one fell three stories when trying to carve his name in the ceiling and it doesn't say whether he's a prisoner or not 
And it doesn't say what year this happened. I couldn't find what year this happened. I almost wonder if this wasn't someone after it wasn't a jail that was doing that. Um, and then the fourth death was when an officer, an actual jailer, accidentally shot himself in the confusion of trying to fortify the facility from an angry mob in 1932. So, I thought, well, gee, um, maybe I need to look at Jake Bird. And so, I looked on their website and could not find anything on Jake Bird. And I was like, wonder why? You know, this is six months after this show aired. This show aired in October, and, you know, I'm recording this at the end of March. And so I'm thinking, wonder why the actual website, if they're trying to get tourists to come to their museum, or they're trying to get paranormal investigators to come investigate the jail, why aren't they talking about Jake Bird? Well, let me tell you a little bit about Jake Bird. Um, Jake Bird died when he was about 47 years old. And he was born in Louisiana, as you hear um, Zach say. But I don't know that he necessarily would have had a Louisiana accent. Even though Zach said that. Which means to me that Zach actually did some research. We know through interviews, we know through um, being on the show, Aaron has stated he doesn't do any research before they go somewhere. A lot of times he doesn't even know, want to know where they're going. Um, he, he stated that if they're going someplace famous, that, that he has heard of before, that he gets too excited, that a lot of times he doesn't get sleep, or he maybe has a tendency to worry. So, he doesn't like to even know where they're going. They usually uh, tell him, hey, you know, we're going to be flying into Omaha, Nebraska, and he's like, oh, great, and gets on the plane, and then once they touch down, and they're in the car driving to wherever, like Council Bluffs, Iowa, then they kind of fill him in a little bit. However, I can never see Zach doing that. He is such a control freak. And he casually mentions in the show, you know, that he thinks it's a Louisiana accent. Well, Jake Bird was born in Louisiana. However, throughout his numerous, which we're going to talk about, arrests, he could never give a city that he was born. He didn't remember. He left at an early age and worked on the railroad, um, helping lay down different railroad tracks and work different construction type jobs and basically was a, a wanderer. Um, his criminal record included burglary, rape, attempted murder, um, he was basically incarcerated for 31 years out of 45. Um, he was put in jail in Michigan, in Utah, obviously in Iowa, and in Washington. Um, he was tried and actually executed for the axe murders 
of Bertha Clude and her 17-year-old daughter, Beverly Clude, in Tacoma, Washington, which is why he is called the Tacoma Axe Killer. Um, and he did this in October of 1947. Um, when they caught him on October 30th of 1947, and they started interviewing him. He actually started almost self-confessing to murdering, he thought, around 45 to 46 different people. And he ended up being hung in Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla, Washington on July 15th in 1949. So like I said, he was captured for the murders in October of 1947, but actually didn't die until 1949. One of the reasons is because when he talked about his travels and he talked about murdering different people, a lot of states wanted to come to Washington and interview him, hoping to close some cold cases. Because when they started interviewing, he said he actually killed people in, now get ready for this, Jake Bird said that he killed people in Florida, Illinois, Iowa, Kansas, Kentucky, Michigan, Nebraska, Ohio, Oklahoma, South Dakota, and Wisconsin. That is quite a murdering spree. Out of the 45 to 46 people that he self-confessed to murdering, however, the states that actually came to interview him could only confirm 11 other murders based on his information. Now, he had detailed information on all these different states, murders in all these different states. However, they weren't actually to, able to confirm them. Like I said, he was found guilty, though, for murdering two people in Washington. Now, the actual um, people that Zach talks about in this episode... They, he was actually captured, um, in, back in 1929, and from what I could find, he was in the Squirrel Cage Jail in Iowa from February to October of 1929. Now, Zach doesn't go into that. Zach doesn't go into the fact that he was there around seven months. And he wasn't found guilty of attempted murder. That's just how long it took his trial to take place. The woman that he was put on trial for attempted murder said that a black person attempted to murder her and her husband. And she, at the time, could not identify him. There was a trial 
And like I said, he wasn't convicted. Um, he, from the newspaper articles that I could kind of find, um, it looks like Jake Bird actually was released in October of 1929 from the Squirrel Cage Jail. He would have been 28 years old. Now remember, I said he died like at the age of 46 or 47. Do we think that he even remembers the squirrel cage jail after I've told you all the states he was in where he murdered people? I told you he was in jail 31 years total. Um, this seven, eight month stop in Iowa's jail, I don't think he probably even registered for him. Um, he seemed like a guy that was literally always in trouble and getting caught for doing something. It is true, however, that on his, or in his trial, in Washington, he did after he was found guilty, and it was decided that they were going to hang him, he did state that he was putting a curse, a hex, on everyone dealing with his trial. And it is also true that the six people involved were... Um, had mysterious deaths. His own lawyer died within a year of him doing that. Now, I couldn't find where there was some weird um, thing. It was just that, I guess that back in 1949, when you state that, and then all of a sudden people stop di start dying, that it's you know, raises a little bit of an alarm. But, um, I couldn't find anything really mysterious about him being in Iowa. So, then it leads me to the question, why go to this place, the Squirrel County Jail, where so, or the squirrel cage jail, where so many people want paranormal investigators to come and investigate. Does the Ghost Adventures crew choose to do that, but search for Jake Bird, who was there seven or eight months? It just doesn't make sense to me. Especially when there are other stories there. And like I said, they have paranormal investigators that are on video, on audio, on their website, talking about seeing a full body apparition. I would think this would get Ghost Adventures all excited to try to capture that. But not to try to capture... Jake Bird. So, let's kind of start talking a little bit about the episode. Um, immediately, when they basically introduce us to the Squirrel Cage Jail, um, they start feeling cold air. And then, Billy immediately gets EMF spikes on um, a new device that, that I haven't seen. And then they immediately, the EMF spikes go away. They start speaking to Julie O'Farrell, who's a volunteer there at the museum, and states that her great uncle was a jailer that had to move out after experiencing different things. And she stated that as a volunteer, she has had experiences on the second floor where there's a noose. And it is the actual noose that an un 
uh, inmate was hung with. And then they kind of hear a metallic noise, and Zach feels cold. And he actually gets Julie to feel the cold area. Well, again, here's where I kind of think Ghost Adventures drops the ball. Why didn't they continue interviewing her? I have a funny feeling, um, knowing Zach and Aaron and Billy, they did. I just don't think that they used any of it. I wanted to know more about this inmate, th more about this news, more about her experiences. And I wanted them to actually go to the second floor and show us this, investigate this, get into this. Then um, they speak to an eyewitness, uh, Byron Gamble. Now, they call him an eyewitness. I'm going to make you a bet he's a paranormal investigator because he talks about being with another guy and them being up in the attic room, which Zach says, oh, you, you mean the apartment? And he says, oh, yeah. And how the other guy he's with tells him, hey, won't you sit in that rocking chair? And so he does. He says hello three times, and a book shoots off the shelf. And he felt a presence, a third presence that was there. And then he would hear slamming noises in his dreams and how now he believes in ghosts. Well, why didn't they go ahead and say, are you a paranormal investigator? Did you find out anything else? Did you document that? Did Because I don't believe that on a normal tour that you pay $7 for, they're just going to let you go run around the jail, and there's going to be two of you up in the apartment upstairs where you're going to be allowed to sit on the rocking chair. That's what leads me to believe that is, He's a paranormal investigator that they actually rented out the place for a couple of hours. Then, um, Zach hears from Greg Jones, who is the security camera technician. And he states that he once felt the stairs going up to the jailer's apartment moving. And after that, he got out of there. He said, I immediately left the building. It, you know, it gave me a weird feeling. Well, no crap. It would me too. Because then he, we see the stairs, the floor. And he says, these are iron stairs. This is an iron floor. It shouldn't have been moving. Um, They don't investigate that. Ghost Adventures throughout this show does not at one time investigate that. They don't put any kind of equipment on it to see if it moves. They don't try to debunk that and move it. Um, they don't jump up and down and see if it shakes. Because this was built in 1885. It's only in the last, I don't know, 15-20 minutes of this episode that they even bother to put an X-cam out there. And they catch the black mass, which we're going to talk about moving there at the end. Um, then they don't tell us they're leaving, but they talk about how it's now day two. And they see a storm moving in. And this is where they split up. And Zach decides to go to the second floor to check out the news. Well, if anybody knows Zach, you knew exactly that's where he's going. Um, Zach admits that he has been thinking nonstop about this news. And immediately he talks about why. And owning haunted objects, they show a picture of his haunted museum. They show a picture of Peggy. They show a picture of the Dybbuk box. 
of course, they're going to get a plug-in for Zach's museum. Immediately upon seeing that, I paused it and looked because I wanted to see, did Zach buy that news? Because the way his eyes lit up when Julie told him about it, I thought, he's going to offer them money for that zoo, that news. He gets into that kind of stuff, and with someone actually dying from that news, he's going to want it. And he talks about how he knows that objects can get a presence about it. Now, I didn't find anything. That may have meant that Zach offered them something and they turned him down, or maybe he decided he didn't want it. I don't know. I just thought it was real unusual that immediately Zach takes off for the second floor to to think about that noose and and look at it. Um, I'm sure was looking at it for blood and everything. I find it, however, unusual that we don't really do a lot of investigating around the news. I know that it has nothing to do with Jake Bird, but you would think with them being paranormal investigators, um, trying to progress the field, trying to collect research, which I know a lot of people don't believe Ghost Adventures tries to do anymore since Nick Groff left. Uh, but you would think them trying to push the envelope a little, that they would try to explore that. And maybe they did. Maybe it just didn't make it into editing. I don't know. But we see that Zach heads off to the second floor, and Billy and Aaron go to the jailer's apartment. Um, the museum recently has found that there's a walled-off space or room um it looks like maybe a hole was punched in the wall which leaves me to wonder what happened because it's not a square like someone actually cut out a piece of the drywall or the actual wall in order to maybe get to a pipe like they had a leak or or anything it kind of almost looks like someone was maybe hanging a pitcher and put a hammer through it and then hit it a couple more times to make it bigger and look around in it but we see that there's a space you know behind this wall um, they start calling it almost like a hidden room. I'm, I'm not 100% sure that it is a hidden room. However, that's how they portrayed it. Um, at a couple different points, Aaron does stick, you know, a camera in there and kind of show us in there. Aaron starts using, uh, an SB7, a spirit box, and they hear search the house. And then when he asks about Jake Bird, they hear, yeah. Well, I don't guess I really understood that. Number one, I didn't hear search the house. Um, I didn't even hear it after they said it. I hate spirit boxes. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you that. I hate the radio frequency noise, the white noise. I don't usually get a lot of what they say. Um, I don't know whether it's the static that drives me up the wall that I can't hear stuff. I did kind of hear the yeah after they said it, but not not really when they first showed it, you know. So, then Aaron asks, what was this room for? And they said they heard an evil laugh, is how uh, Billy puts it, uh, evil laughter. Again, I didn't hear any laughter. Um, not sure 
that may have been, you know, you may have heard it. Then we meet uh, Cat Slaughter, who is the manager of the museum. And they sit down, and it's obvious that they've already reviewed the audio evidence before sitting down with her uh, because they know what's coming and what they heard and, and what they make out. But they're just wanting to, her to kind of verify it. And they hear search the house. Now, the look on her face, I'm not sure that she understood that until they told her. Um, and then they hear he's hiding and need the weapons or leave the weapons. And then they hear kill him with something. Now, the weapons, I did hear. I heard weapons. I didn't hear need or leave the weapons. But I made out weapons. She did too. Um, but the rest of it, yeah, I I didn't understand it. Um, and like I said, kind of the look on her face, I'm not sure that she did either. However, uh, weapons, she, she heard, you could tell she heard something, and when they asked her what, she said weapons. And she admitted she didn't understand the beginning part of it. So, I was glad I'm... I'm semi on track, you know. And then we see Cat lock them in the jail. We see them put Jay at Nerve Center. And when I see Jay at Nerve Center, I realize that we saw, you know, Jay in some shots. And I guess I made the assumption that he was running the camera a lot. Because we didn't see him very much at all this episode. Which is fine with me. Because if you've listened to previous episodes about uh, me talking about Ghost Adventures in the past. I think Jay is creepy. I think he's weird. I do not get a good feeling about him whatsoever. He creeps me out. I don't want to see him. So it was great that he was not in this episode. For all of you Jay lovers out there, I am sorry Please, please don't write me and tell me how much you love Jay. Because, yeah, don't care. Um, however, if you do want to write me about anything else, you guys know you can hit me up on Paranormal Reviews Twitter or Paranormal Reviews uh, Facebook page. Or you can write me at Paranormal Review Pod, all one word, and it's singular, Paranormal Review Pod at gmail.com. Uh, but um, Zach decides he wants to field test a piece of brand new equipment from Gary Galka. And we have seen him in previous episodes. Uh, they even did an episode about the Galka family and why he started creating different pieces of equipment. This uh, piece of equipment, I'm not real sure about. Um, Zach kind of explains it to a point, and then he uses it, and I get it. Um, he explains it that it's an SB7 spirit box connected, and he says, to a unit. And that's what, I guess, raised a red flag. What kind of unit? It, he doesn't really describe that. But he says, this is an SB7 connected to a unit that allows them to listen to it, reverse it, or slow it down. Now, I'm not real big on the whole reversing things. I don't understand that concept. If any of you do, feel free to write me. Uh, like I said, paranormalreviewpod at gmail.com. Um, explain to me the whole reversing phenomenon. I don't, I, I really don't get that. But then they go to Jake Bird's cell. I want to know how they know that that's Jake Bird's cell. I want to know if there were records. And remember, 
this is not a line of cells. This is a cylinder. Think of a Lazy Susan cabinet that has pie-shaped cells. And you can spin it to get to the particular cell you want. So how do they know this is actual Jake Bird's cell that he spent seven or eight months in in 1929? Almost a hundred years ago for seven or eight months. But anyway, um, they say they go to Jake Bird's cell, and Zach talks about how Jake put a hex on people. And they hear three bangs, and I do hear the bangs. Um, Aaron feels like all the spirits are waking up in the place. And he kind of describes that really well about how he feels like the place is coming alive. Like everyone is waking up and getting interested. And had this been a normal investigation, I think I would have loved that part. But they're focusing so much on Jake Bird making this mini series about serial killers that I'm like, Please, guys, go get evidence of paranormal. Go get something that we can research later, that we can prove actual evidence. Quit looking for Jake Bird. But anyway, um, Zach starts using this new piece of equipment, and he asks, you know, a couple questions, and then he describes he's pausing it, he's slowing it down 20%, and then he's hitting another button and going back 10 seconds. And they hear, where are you? So, I'm trying to process how I want to explain this because I don't get it why on a normal SB7 can we hear static can we hear interference we can hear white noise we can hear radio stations and they can make out something like search the house. But yet, on this new piece of equipment, Zach has to slow it down by 20% to hear, where are you? Does that mean certain spirits we don't get because they say things too fast or they talk fast? Or why does slowing it down not make it talk slower? Why does it sound like I'm talking now? I don't get that part of it. So then he turns it so that it goes back live and Zach holds up an axe. And he says a whole, whole lot. And then he turns on the SB7, which I thought was on all along, but not. And he asks... How did you make the husband do that? And what he's asking is all of that garbage that he was saying before, he basically was talking about, did Jake Bird put a curse on the husband and the wife that he was um, put in jail for trying to attempt murder and the husband later killed 
the wife. Um, did Jake Bird make the husband do that? How did he make him do that? So again, Zach pauses it slows it down again 20% and goes back 10 seconds and they hear come attack me well that doesn't make any sense come attack me why why would Jake Bird say that are they talking to the spirit of a another person in that cell Maybe that was in that cell way longer than seven or eight months. Maybe they're talking to a person that was in that cell, um, you know, closer than a hundred years ago. Maybe they're talking to the husband. I don't know, but I don't think they're talking to Jake Bird. They also capture a strobing light orb that came from the cell when they reviewed the footage and in that they also hear you got it and get back again with the whole slowing down 20 percent and going back and pausing and all of that rigmarole that they're doing uh, and then, all of a sudden, all of them kind of go out of breath. And so, we now find out through a timestamp that it's 1129, and they head back to Nerve Center because they're not feeling great. They're out of breath. Uh, we see Zach all of a sudden um, show up in a respirator. And I'm wondering why. There's no explanation why all of a sudden he's on a respirator. Um, I'm wondering if there's dust in there, if his asthma is acted up, maybe he's had an asthma attack. There's no explanation for why Zach now has a respirator on. But they go upstairs to the apartment. And I start thinking, well... Maybe since that hole is now in the apartment, someone has mentioned to Zach that, you know, there could possibly be asbestos in there or something like that. And that's why he has the respirator on. I just wish that they would have let us know why. Um, and as they're going upstairs, Zach sees a black kind of darting shadow, which leads him to want to start taking pictures. Well, hello, it says on the Squirrel Cage jail website that in that upstairs apartment, they see full body apparitions. Yeah, you might see darting black shadows. Yes, you need to be taking pictures. Hello, guys. Get on this. I want you to find something. But um, Aaron says that he just feels a presence. He feels something. And they hear a noise. So, Zach asks them to leave, and he wants to be up there alone. He sits down in the rocking chair and tells them, you know, I want to be alone. And then he shows us a music box that people have said sometimes it plays on its own. So he puts a camera near it, and he sits down in the rocking chair. And I thought, oh, we're for sure now going to hear that music box play while Zach's sitting there rocking. And we don't, but, but I thought for sure we were going to. Um, we see that they've placed... They tell us now that they've placed an X camera um, near Jake Bird's cell on the second floor, but it's capturing strange lights in a cell that is beside of Jake Bird's cell. So... They holler at Zach, who's in the upstairs apartment, and tell him about this, and his voiceover, and I replayed this three times, his voiceover says he 
goes and sets up a full spectrum camera on the first floor and then goes back up to the apartment. Well, I don't understand what he means there. Remember, this is a three story jail. And the apartment is on the fourth floor. Jake Bird's cell is on the second floor. So why would Zach go to the first floor, which is where the offices are, which is where Jay, Aaron, and Billy are, to set up a full-spectrum camera? And then they capture a black mass moving under the stairs leading to that upstairs apartment. But they don't show it in full spectrum. So this whole section just kind of confuses me. And then we see at 1242 that Zach asks for Billy to bring up a digital recorder. So he's been wandering around for about an hour, what, in almost 20 minutes. He's been up there alone. They or they've been up there together. He's asked to be alone. He's ran down, got a camera, set it up, and then went back up to the apartment. And now he's asking for Billy to bring up a digital recorder and an SLS camera. Well, while Zach is still messing around, Billy and Aaron go to Jake Bird's cell. They use the paranormal puck device, which Billy loves, um, to type, are you moving our device? Because Aaron lays the EMF device in the doorway of the cell, and the answer is mostly. Now, a lot of people have poked holes in the paranormal puck. Um, I know Billy enjoys using it, but here's the thing. I'm going to be extremely honest with you guys. In this instance, I don't believe for one second they are communicating with Jake Bird. Now, they may be communicating with some other spirit, but remember... Number one, Jake Bird was born in 1901. He was a black man born in Louisiana. Racism was still very rampant. There were a lot of black men that did not know how to read, let alone type. And he doesn't even remember what town or city he was born in because he left at an early age and traveled all over the place. He did manual labor. So I don't believe for one minute that 28-year-old Jake Bird is in Squirrel Cage Jail knowing or being able to figure out the paranormal puck device, being able to read what Billy types, and then being able to manipulate that device to type the word mostly. I'm sorry. I don't believe it. And that's not the skeptic in me. That's the logical me. Because I don't even believe that Jake Bird in 1949, when he was hung, could have done that. Do I believe that he could speak to a recorder? Sure. But do I believe that he understood 
that paranormal puck and could read Billy's responses, or I should say questions, no. And I don't definitely believe that he could figure out how to type mostly back to him. Not for one second. Now, could it have been another spirit? Sure. I will give them credit all day on that. But that's the thing. They weren't looking for other spirits. They were looking for Jake Bird. So then we go back to Zach and he places two recorders, one on the rocking chair, one on the organ, in the upstairs apartment. And again, he's using the ovulus. Again, do I think that Jake Bird can use the ovulus? No. No, I don't. Uh, for the same exact reasons that I don't believe that he was using the paranormal puck. Now, do I think someone else could? Yes. Definitely. So, that's why I think Ghost Adventure should have expanded this investigation that they're conducting. I don't think they're getting any evidence of Jake Bird. None. Are they getting evidence of other spirits? Yes, maybe. I don't, I don't even know that we can call it that, though. But anyway, um... The word choose pops up, and then the words Faye and Jackie pop up. Well, why didn't they investigate that at all? Why didn't anybody research that? Is there a Faye and Jackie that have lived in that apartment? Is there a Faye or Jackie that work on the staff? Is there a Faye and Jackie that were important to the town? But they, they didn't go anywhere with that. And if you did research it and you didn't get anything, admit that. But otherwise, why show it? Anyway, then Billy and Aaron decide to go down to the basement of the jail. And they use a static detector that I've never seen them use. And they hear some thumps. And then Billy said that he's going to use a new equipment pod. And Zach and Billy start kind of describing this as a faster SB7, a spirit box, that scans radio frequencies, whether... The, it, they're analog or they're internet, they don't say. But it can go up to 10 times faster. Uh, so it's supposed to be, I guess, more um, evidence. Uh, more, if something can speak across 15 to 20 different frequencies that it's going through, then it must be of a, a a spirit or entity nature. Well, why didn't you use that earlier? Why did you bother with the device, the unit, whatever words you want to use, that the SB7 was connected to where you can slow things down? I... I don't understand why we're using all these different things. Um, but Billy feels like he gets tapped on the shoulder. And then they hear, not in the basement, is what Aaron says. In the moment, Aaron says, not in the basement. However, when they explain it, they say they hear out in the basement. But when they replay it again, you specifically hear Aaron saying, not in the basement. So, again, they didn't, you know, um, 
call attention to the differences there. They didn't explain themselves. Um, when they ask if any cellmates are there, Aaron's comment makes more sense. Not in the basement. But Billy then asks, who are you? And they get, is there a name? And then they hear, I'm, and they can't make it out. Now, it just is real unusual to me. I, I wish they would have used both. Why can't you use both? Why can't you use the SB7 that is connected to the device, the one you can slow down 20% in replay, plus the one in real time? But anyway, uh, Billy says, I challenge you to come through this device. And they say they hear Jake Bird fight. I didn't hear either one of those. Uh, Billy then asks if this is Jake Bird. And the response is, is that a demand? And then they hear a laugh. Then we see... Zach up in the apartment and he opens the door leading to the squirrel cage cylinder and you can see that and he captures some screams on the recorder and he says he feels like there's a presence there upstairs. And then when he goes back downstairs to talk to Billy and Aaron, he tells them that he feels like he was kicked, kicked, and Billy says, in the testicles? And Zach says, yeah, and it, it was painful. And we hear Aaron say, well, yeah, it, it felt like that he got kicked in the nuts earlier, because you you hear him actually say that. And then they kind of end the investigation saying that that they think, you know, Jake Bird's there. Well, man, oh man, I love Ghost Adventures. I've loved them from the beginning. Um, I loved it when it was the three of them together and how they conducted themselves and how they conducted their investigations how excited they were, how they wanted to push the envelope, how they wanted to conduct research, how they wanted the field of paranormal to grow. This is one episode that I feel like I can pull out from now on and say, and show it to someone and say, I don't know if Ghost Adventures is about that anymore. And I know some of you are going to get angry. Um, I'm still a fan of Ghost Adventures. I don't want you guys to think that. But I am going to be able to pull this one episode out and say, watch this. This is not Jake Bird. They're not talking to Jake Bird. I don't think that they even believe they're talking to Jake Bird. I don't think for one minute that Billy and Aaron thought that they were talking to Jake Bird in that basement for one second. However, they had already made up their mind. They were doing a four-part serial killer episode. And for some reason, they went to Squirrel Cage Jail knowing that Jake Bird had been there for seven or eight months. When he was 28 years old. That he didn't die for another 20 years. There's no reason for him to be attached to that place. He wasn't born there. He didn't grow up there. The love of his life wasn't there. He wasn't killed there. He didn't have some traumatic event there. There's no reason for his spirit or entity to be there. 
And Ghost Adventures doesn't explain why it would be there. They try out two pieces of equipment without having a control of a piece of equipment that they've used in the past. They... Zack asked for an SLS camera. Yet we never saw it used. We were introduced to a second floor noose that they never showed again. That they, as far as we know, never investigated. Um, they present on their own website of seeing full body apparitions, of hearing a little girl, of feeling a female presence. That was never explored, never talked about. Where is Ghost Adventures going? What is their vision now? What is their mission now? What are they doing? Are they just making a TV show now? Is that what it's about? Because in this episode, I don't see them researching. I don't really even see them collecting evidence. I don't see them debunking. I don't see them pushing the envelope. In this particular episode... I don't even know who they are anymore. It's just disappointing. It it really is. Um, if any of you guys out there, though, disagree with me on this, or can explain this, or anything, you have any questions, comments, problems, protests, anything... Feel free. I am on Paranormal Review Twitter and Facebook. You can write me at ParanormalReviewPod at gmail.com. Holler at me and let's talk about this. Give me your points of view. Zach, Aaron, Billy, Jay. If you're listening to this, write me. I'm a fan. Tell me what happened. Tell me where you're going. Tell me what you're doing. Um, tell me this is a one-time thing. Please, please, please. But um, I want to thank all of you guys for sitting down and, and listening to this and going on this trek with me. Um, I really do appreciate it, and I hope to hear from you guys soon. Um, if you have listened to this episode this far, uh, feel free to go on podchaser.com and review it. Um, that's also another way you can contact me. Uh, rate it and review it. Uh, the reason why I suggest that is even if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, um, everybody doesn't. And a lot of podcatchers out there, such as the one I use, I use Pocket Casts, um, they don't allow you to rate and review it. So if you don't care, go over to Podchaser and rate and review this. Uh, let me know what you think of this whole entire episode, what you think of w- what's going on. Um, and subscribe. I'm going to be doing other TV shows. I'm going to be doing Ghost Adventures again. Um, I want to see the fourth one. Uh, The fourth one's Ted Bundy. And so I I want to see it. I want to see what they do. Because it's my understanding they go to Utah. Which, as far as I know, um, Ted Bundy wasn't there. Maybe he was, and I don't know it. I was under the understanding he was in the Northwest and also in Florida. I may be totally wrong. So uh, be looking for that episode coming up. And be looking for more um, 
Holzer Files and Destination Fear and Ghost uh, Nation and Ghost Hunters and It Feels Evil and Hauntings in the Heartland and all of those. If there's a particular episode that you want me to do or a particular show you want me to do, then write me and tell me. But I will talk to you guys soon.